Hello, dear friends. We are sincerely glad to welcome you again. And today we will have a conversation with the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Hello. Igor Mikhailovich, in the previous video we discussed the process of informing people about the Creative Society project, and we raised the issue of how volunteers, sometimes without realizing it, come across situations when they knock on closed doors of empty rooms. And you told us in each specific case why no one would actually open that door and why there is emptiness behind that door. So our viewers very well remember the associative example which you gave while telling about a person who came to see the entire reality of what is happening in the world. As a very conscious and sensible person, he understood that it is necessary to act, it is necessary to save his own life and the lives of his near and dear ones and all people on the planet. And so he makes a decision to inform all people across the planet that there is a way out, that the way out is the creative society, and that's where there is a chance to save this world. Thus he takes the following action. He spends his $5,000, which he saved for vacation, on reaching out to the brightest stars on the human Olympus, political celebrities, movie stars and renowned scientists, in the hope that they will pick up this information wave and convey information about the real state of affairs to people. So he writes 5,000 letters to those celebrities, waits for a response, and suddenly realizes that the stone which he threw has fallen not into the water, but onto the asphalt, so there won't be any response. You know, a lot of our friends who are volunteers of the Creative Society project recognize themselves in this example. And they said, yes, now we know what the wrong way to act is, but what is actually the right way? What is the alternative in this situation, in fact? How could one allocate this amount of money in order to maximize or significantly increase the efficiency of informing people? Well, those of our friends who acted this way and now understand that they acted hastily, now know for sure what they should do, while for others who also think so, but haven't gained this experience yet. I can explain it. Perhaps. Last time we said that we gave people an opportunity to make such a tactical mistake, I would say. But what does it mean that we gave people an opportunity? This point is also very important, because we could have stopped people at any moment and explained that, guys, you are knocking on a closed door of an empty room, no one is going to answer you. But do you know what would remain? People would have probably listened to us and acted in a different way. But inside, they would still bear hope that this cannot be so, you know? That those people who did it before us didn't convey information properly, they recounted something in a wrong way, or approached the text in a wrong way. Everything will be different for me, for sure. Of course, I actually understood. Yes, exactly. And since I understood, it means I will be able to explain to our celebrities, to our Olympians, that this is very important information, and in fact, even they are under direct threat now, not only us, everyone will suffer. The Cerberus doesn't choose whom to eat, right? That's exactly what would happen. <laughs> well, that's how it happens. Consciousness always says that it happened to someone, of course. but it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me, because I will be able to evoke a response. Yes, sure, exactly. But practice shows something else. Practice is such a stubborn thing, friends, that whether you argue or not, this is life. It's like mathematics. Again, what would be the right thing to do in almost any case? But in this case, we are talking about a volunteer who decided to sacrifice his vacation right. and spend 5,000 on informing people. There are certainly lots of options, but the easiest and most acceptable one for a person would be to take that money and go on vacation as he wanted. Really, friends, who prevents you from going on vacation and telling people about the Creative Society there? No one. Believe me, it would be much more efficient than relying on those celebrities. We already told you that reaching out to them is useless and pointless, you have to understand that politicians are driven into certain conditions and almost nothing depends on them. They will start talking about the Creative Society only when there is an electoral demand, when the majority of their voters demand from them exactly to build the Creative Society. Then a politician will have no other choice 
He will promote the Creative Society platform. And if there are almost 100% of such people, it means they will carry it out. There is no escaping that. Celebrities of those very movies, as you said, of show business or something else, we also have to understand them. People who have climbed Olympus, thanks to their work or circumstances, it doesn't matter. They understand perfectly well that they are only temporarily on this Olympus. And, as we already said, they already develop a hatred for people because they are dependent on them. Naturally, they are already becoming sociopaths in some sense. This is a natural process. Plus, they would have come and told people for a lot of money. And it seems, what does money have to do with this, right? Where is humaneness? But what kind of humaneness can a sociopath have? A simple question. None. And they understand perfectly well that their finest hour is temporary. And certainly, if they don't earn money now, or if they come to us for free, they will have to go to others for free as well, right? They did their best, let's say, and laid down their own lives when climbing this Olympus, not in order to serve some humanity later on. You know, those are just beautiful words, while in fact they are detached from the world. They have their own world in which they exist in their illusions, in their values, and they are already far from ours. Let's take scientists. They are also stars with world names and the like. And their names are first in the books they publish. But in reality, these books are written by those whose names are the last in these books. And of course, we feel sorry for those people, to reach out to them, to people who only know how to build a career and how to receive grants and survive in these hardest conditions of the modern consumerist format. Guys, they have no time to do science. And as for supporting the Creative Society, you know, for them, if they are dependent on grants, dependent on those very residents of Olympus, it is fraught with falling from a good comfortable chair. Will they do that? Of course not. Again, whose efficiency is higher for society and for you? Of the one who works in a tire service and brings benefit by developing the creative society in addition? Or of that scientist with zero efficiency for humanity? who devours your money like a black hole, while in fact being an impenetrable jungle, blocking the light of science. This is the reality. This is one side. The other side is, if they were really true scientists, they would have come to us themselves a long time ago. After all, many come, those who really understand, and those true scientists who themselves are able to get to the bottom of what we are talking about. And there are many such examples they don't even necessarily come to us, but they speak on similar topics, openly and honestly. What do scientists actually have to do with this? Let's take ordinary bloggers who study seriously, study climate change, or the behavior of some volcano, or something else, and they come to understand what we are talking about. It is enough just to give them a hint, and they notice these interrelations, right? How can a deep focus earthquake that occurred in Argentina affect Yellowstone? After all, those are really very smart and literate people who, delving into the essence of the processes, begin to understand them themselves. Well, we've just mentioned deep focus earthquakes quite recently, just a little while ago. We were talking about the fact that such problems would begin in the near future. And those very scientists with big names, with their names in the books, at the top of the list, told us and the whole world that we were mistaken, that this could not happen, that an earthquake could only occur in the Earth's crust. Well, it's not that thick, so that cannot happen, right? But this is actually happening. A little bit of time had passed, and we saw earthquakes at a depth of more than 80 kilometers, 409 kilometers, 610 kilometers, and it certainly affects those volcanoes which are already tying shoelaces on their sneakers. They are about to start erupting, and this is visible. Therefore, who is more valuable? To put it simply, 
those people who have reached this understanding and who have already traced these connections themselves without our tips, or those scientists who to this day do not really understand how deep focus earthquakes can form. After all, there is no crust there, there is nothing to shake, the medium there is liquid. Such pseudo-scientists become dangerous to society when the truth is revealed. Very dangerous. They will fight, defend their ideas, which they do not actually have, and they will contradict everyone and everything. Because of such pseudo-scientists, all progress is being held back. And the worst thing is that they don't bear responsibility for that. When they say, this cannot happen, but it happens, such scientists should resign all his authority, publicly admit that he spent a huge amount of taxpayers' money in vain. At least apologize and leave science because he doesn't belong there. Has anyone acted that way in recent decades? Tell me, please. Well, that's how it should be. If a person calls himself a scientist, makes a forecast, or denies someone's forecast, but then this event happens, or his forecast is not confirmed, he must be held responsible for that, because he's a scientist. You know? I'll give you a simple example. It's like you come to an accountant to get your salary, for example. And he tells you that today, instead of 5,000 euros, you get 1,000 euros. You ask him, why? He says, well, that's what I calculated. And that's all. Such is the accountant's math. Will you agree with that? No, you won't. Why? How come? You've been underpaid. Just look how it happens in life. And as for the fact that a lot of scientists are sitting on your backs and putting your life at risk and danger, and they are not doing what they are supposed to be doing, we all tolerate that and keep silent. This is really scary. Now, let's look at the other side. Let's go back to our volunteer who decided to spend his well-earned $5,000 on vacation and then changed his mind and decided to spend it on the Creative Society, on humanity, on saving himself, his family, his loved ones, all of humanity in our planet. We have already said he could go on vacation and inform people. Or if he doesn't want to go on vacation, doesn't want to spend it, but he wants to do more, he has the right, he is a human, he is a free man in a democratic country. What can he do? Spend it on the internet. For example, he can record an appeal that he wanted to compose, the one he believed that with that particular appeal he would reach the celebrities. Well, the same appeal can be sent to normal people, those who want to live, people just like him. He can at least spend money on advertising this text on the internet. At any rate, at least 5,000 people, if not more, would learn about it. Even out of 5,000 people, at least five people would join to help him. Isn't it so? And that's already five people. Now, let us look. Some will say, oh, but who would join him? Not scientists and not celebrities. Yes, not scientists and not celebrities. Perhaps one of the guys who works at the tire service and someone from McDonald's would come, even two people. But those are two people. Those are two young people who want to live and whose future is in danger. So they have something to worry about. They can work hard and they have understood the whole depth of the problem. Or that old scientist, and as a rule, they are all elderly, who thinks, well, it's enough for my lifetime, and after me, let there be a flood. Why? Because they are egoists. If they weren't egoists, would they put their names at the top on someone else's paper? Tell me, doesn't it happen that way? And here's the point. It happens everywhere, in every country, all around, far and wide. You know, I have a feeling that it's like some kind of mafia that was formed throughout centuries, and to this day, they have such a tradition. The one on top oppresses those on the bottom. And it becomes even clearer of that course. there is no solution with such people. Of course not. Because they are only a problem for society. They are a problem for society, not a solution. And the more you look at this, the more you want to build the creative society faster. A society where such things cannot happen a priori. 
a society in which scientists will be evaluated according to their efficiency factor for society as a whole. If you call yourself a scientist, or rather, before you are called a scientist, you should make some contribution to public life, should really improve our life. Let it be 0.01%. But for the whole humanity, well, 0.01% may seem like a small thing, but 100 such people is 1%, while a thousand people is how much? This is already 10%. And what does it mean to improve life by 10% in the creative society, where there is everything and everything is wonderful? That's a whole lot. Just look, a small group of people, while nowadays there are millions of those who are called scientists, in a small group compared to modern times, and it improves our life by 10%. How much does our life improve every year nowadays? Tell me. At least every year. That's the answer. What is a better thing to do? It's better to have normal people with enthusiasm than, pardon me, empty hope. I'll put it this way. If you want to see circles from your actions, from a stone you throw, throw it in the water. Do not throw it on asphalt. You will not see them on asphalt. Everything is very simple, friends. Some people will say, how come? Five thousand and only two helpers. But friends, I'll say it again, five thousand people who have really learned about the Creative Society from what you have sent to them. Is that a bad thing? Yes, they are inert. They are inactive. Only two active helpers came, as we said, from a tire service and from McDonald's while the rest stayed at home on the couch. But they know about the Creative Society. They know about the climate problems. And when the Cerberus comes to their backyard, they will at least have a chance to regret not supporting you in time. On the other hand, when they see someone else later on, maybe they will get interested, investigate and dig deeper. Maybe your message came to them at the wrong time, and they were unprepared. But they will see the Cerberus walking around in other people's backyards, and maybe they will be inspired for it not to come to their own yards. That means more helpers, right? Yes. One should invest money in people in disseminating right. information in this way. What's the point in investing in emptiness? Investing in a really empty room where there is supposedly someone. There is nobody there. In any case, very often in those rooms where Olympus stars are sitting, there is just emptiness, and it's not worth investing your money there. It is similar to a black hole, you see, which sucks all matter in, and that's where it stays. Meanwhile, friends, we need to build the Creative Society within a short period of time. We are doing our best, doing everything that depends on us, and this is right. Igor Mikhailovich, I also wanted to discuss another thing with you. There are many initiatives proposed by people. In particular, there is the following initiative. Why don't we focus all our efforts and all our capabilities on informing people in a specific country and building the creative society in a specific country? This very action would be a wonderful example for the further dissemination of information about a creative society so that people in other countries would also want to live such a wonderful life. Right. Question. Is it possible to build a creative society in a separate country or in a group of countries? It's impossible, friends. We already discussed this. But since the question arises again, I believe it is worth answering. The thing is that if we do it in one country, or even in a commonwealth of countries, even the richest and most powerful countries of this world, if we gather them, we would divide the world into two halves, and one half of the world the richest and most successful countries would gather, and in the other half there would remain the poorest ones. So if we begin to build the creative society in the richest part of the world, will anything work out? Nothing will. The most we would succeed in is to make a consumerist format with a social bias. Nothing more. Why? Let me explain. Those countries which continue to exist, even if several countries remain in the consumerist format, would compete with the countries where the Creative Society develops. Hence, in any case, based on the consumerist format, they would be preparing for war, arming themselves, forming their armies, and they would be a military threat to the countries which have adopted the Creative Society. This means that in the countries that have adopted the Creative Society, 
it would also be necessary to form armies and develop new kinds of weapons. Thus we come to the point that the smartest people on our planet, those who could make and would make our lives better, would be forced to work in closed engineering design bureaus and create new kinds of weapons. Here's the answer for you. Moreover, it would not be economically feasible. We either build the creative society all over the world and terminate all wars, all strife and all divisions into languages, nations, and everything else once and for all, end divisions into majority and minority. There is no such a concept as majority and minority. There is a concept of people. There is a concept of earthlings. That's the important and main point. We should put an end, once and for all, to all evil, hatred and everything that the consumerist format has imposed on us over 6,000 years of its existence. And then, a new world will open up before us. But throughout the entire world, there will be no other way. There will be either nothing or everything, you know? It's like they say, to risk it all, nothing will work out otherwise. I'll put it simply, there will be either the Cerberus or the Creative Society. We have no choice, whether we want it or not. If we are human beings and we want to live, we must build the Creative Society, because it is really the only way out for us, no matter what we will call it. Somebody may not like the name Creative Society, and they may want to call it something else. It doesn't matter what we will call it. It's important for the essence not to change, and then everything will be fine, right? Igor Mikhailovich, many people already understand and have heard that the Creative Society is a society of equal people and equal opportunities, and they are afraid. Will that very private property be abolished in the Creative Society, for instance? Or will private property be preserved in the Creative Society? Let's just say, the communist idea, where there is no private property, is unacceptable in this case. There definitely must be private property. A private house, a private car, if you own a plot of land. I'm figuratively saying, and you want to grow tomatoes on it. When you have a replicator at home, it's your personal business. Grow them. It's your private property. It's a different matter that it will not be possible to privately own what nature gives us. It's inappropriate to privately own the air, the land, that which is in the ground, or the ocean. How? It's all ours. Let's take water. After all, we don't produce it, although a replicator will produce everything. But the concept of private property should apply to what is really essential for a person and what can actually belong to him without infringing upon the rights of other people. Right? Whereas nowadays, the Earth's bowels are in private ownership. Friends, how can this be understood? And now some people have reached the point of insanity and already want to sell air. Well, to be more precise, not air, but emissions produced by humanity, carbon dioxide. And scientists are already developing special devices that will control how much carbon dioxide we exhale. And the funniest thing is that they have calculated that in Germany, an average person produces about 10 tons of emissions a year. So they suggest that three tons would be for free, and a person has to buy the rest. Buy it from those who will still have it. Who do not breathe, yes, right. Yes, exactly. Those who breathe less. <laughs> less than three tons. Individual restriction of CO2. I'll put it this way. Yogis will get rich, while sports enthusiasts should prepare their wallets. Tell me, is this not insanity? You see, we have a lot of taxes on all and everything. Well, there will also be an air tax. They forbid breathing. Well, I have no words. I'll tell you this, there will be either the Creative Society or the Cerberus, because we are sliding further into utmost insanity. In Europe, they have already officially allowed the use of house crickets, arthropods, mm -hmm. pardon me, and bugs as a food additive. Well, those are arthropods that are ground into flour and added to bread, to pizza, to soups, and somewhere else. But it seems to me that it was saboteurs who came up with this idea, exactly the opponents of the CO2 theory. Why? I will explain. As a matter of fact, flour made of chitin-containing insects, so to say, 
when getting into a human body will contribute to gas generation. And thus, CO2 will increase very intensively. So here, it's not understandable. Are they fighting to reduce CO2? Or are they fighting hunger instead of raising cows that will produce much less CO2 than people who consume such flour? As for me, I haven't understood this joke. This is sabotage. This is some kind of sabotage. Those are probably saboteurs. In any case, I don't really want to eat all sorts of grasshoppers. This way, we will end up eating frogs. Although some people do eat frogs. They say it's delicious. Well, to each their own. Anyway, somehow you feel like a frog too when eating insects. Igor Mikhailovich, you know, a lot of people around the world see the absurdity of this consumer society and they certainly do not want to tolerate it internally. So they do everything possible to draw attention to every single problem in order to get the public to focus on addressing that local problem. Divide and conquer. That's how Satan acts. He creates a problem for everyone and diverts attention to it. And a lot of smart, talented people are fighting for the rights of minorities for the rights of, I don't know, insects, not to be eaten, or for some other rights. Meanwhile, these are all symptoms of the same disease. This whole human stupidity is insurmountable under a consumerist format. Yes, we can succeed in defending the rights of minorities, but then the rights of animals will immediately be trampled. We can succeed in defending the rights of animals, but then the rights of children will be attacked. It's a never-ending story. The only solution is the creative society. That's where everyone's rights have to be taken into account. Do you know why? Because the laws and rights will be written by us, friends. By us, the people not those celestials who descended from us, yet climbed up to their Olympus by stepping on our heads and our lives. And from there, they send to us, us, the biomass, who, like frogs, have to eat all kinds of bugs and crickets. They send to us their laws written for us, for the herd. If we don't want to remain pack animals, we must become humans, and we must build the creative society. We have no other option, friends. Or we can remain sheep, waiting to be skinned. It is also an option, but it's unacceptable. So, friends, let's just remain humans. Let's say, be worthy of the title of a human being, this is important, and everything will be fine for us, right? Therefore, let's just love each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Igor Mikhailovich, for your support and for everything. Thank you, friends. Peace be with you.